part two of our um, walk through um, Butler's gender trouble. In this second video, part two, um, we're going to look at chapter two in the book. And in that chapter, we're going to uh, jump away from Butler's text to examine the structural uh, psychoanalytic social theory that she um, incorporates into her text. Um, I think she does a wonderful job with it. Um, she, the, again, her argument hangs together very tightly. Um, it, it's masterful. Again, for, for uh, she she was a young a young scholar when she did this, and it's it is really um, a, a work of power. Most of us haven't probably read or haven't read recently um, the mid century psychoanalytic social theory that she is uh, is 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 drawing on, um, in particular Lacan, uh, Levi-Strauss, and, and Freud. And um, so what I'm going to do is, is try to create um, a skeleton key to Butler's gender trouble, a kind of way to unlock the argument, especially in chapter two, and that, that retroactively will help you make better sense of chapter one and chapter three uh, by walking through uh, some of the problematic uh, uh, sections of the um, of, of Levi Strauss, Lacan, and Freud uh, that she engages with. And um, so there we are. So part two. Um, here we go. So uh, again, bear with me on this a little bit. You're going to see some of my um, sort of bizarre uh, drawings and things as we go. Um, um, sorry about them. Just just a bit of a warning. There's there you can't get around uh, some sexual content. Um, you just can't in in when you're talking about Freud or Lacan or Butler. It just has to be there. So. Um, yeah, I'll, it, it, believe me, nothing's going to get over a, 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 I don't know, PG or a, a, a level, but I just want to provide a little bit of a warning. Okay, so in, in Gender Trouble, Chapter 2, Butler remains uh, legitimately, oh yeah, she examines legitimizing mythic accounts of the formation of gender, right? The prehistory of gender that apparently legitimates the gender sex system. So she's looking and, and making comparisons to really any juridical system, any legal system that tends to generate, again, a kind of legitimating rhetoric, a myth of its origins, and so on, talking at least at some point about what life was like before the law, and then having um, um, a, uh, that, that legitimates the need for it, right? So in the world of gender and sexual differentiation, especially binary gender, um, the, the, the um, you really, that's the sociological theory or the social theory that most directly provides us with a sort of grounding in the historical emergence of binary gender and binary sex is is um, is uh, uh, Freud and uh, totem and taboo, and then uh, Le Levi Strauss who follows on uh, Freud and Lacan who follows on Freud, and of course we know that Levi Strauss and Lacan um, knew each other well. They actually, you know, I think. Le Levi Strauss has actually sat in on some of Lacan's uh, seminars, and we know that the symbolic realm, one of the the, the three sort of registers of uh, that constitute reality, along with the imaginary and the real in Lacan, is essentially a transposition of structural anthropology from Levi Strauss. Right. So these three thinkers really went together. Okay. So um, so I'm, I'm trying to move quickly because we have a lot to get through here, and I'd like to try. Uh, to, to, to sort of keep in mind that the goal to uh, Butler is to identify possible futures, right? Future arrangements of gender and sex and desire that can be located in the comprehension of uh, a pre-patriarchal past, right? Like, at least she claims that this is what some feminists are doing, right? That they're trying to look at the origin of binary gender and the origin of binary sex in order to um, unpack the kind of possibilities of these apparently natural categories that aren't natural uh, so that we can understand what a subversive um, sexuality uh, would would look like and what its possibilities might be. Okay, so, um, so on page 52, um, um, Butler um, references um, Levi Strauss's structural anthropology, especially the elementary um, forms of kinship, uh, which I happen to have in front of me. And, and um, yeah, so let's just take a moment to use Levi-Strauss to sort of unpack some of what um, 
20th century structuralism actually was. Okay? So, God, I almost hate to do this. Um, yeah, so page 33, um, Levi Strauss uh, identifies sort of the basic sort of principles of structuralism um, and, and it can locates its origin in structural linguistics, you know, Saussure and others. And he says that first structural linguistics shifts from the study of conscious linguistic phenomena to study of their unconscious unconscious infrastructure. Now, to me, this is really important. I'm, I'm, I'm pausing here for a moment. To Levi Strauss and to a large degree to Freud and Lacan, um, the kind of, you know, um, it is almost impossible to comprehend a subject's behavior or a society's behavior by attending to their conscious uh, account, right? So when you ask people to account for their behavior, they often provide an account that's inadequate. If we've ever seen, you know, we've all seen this, right? Um, that the story that people tell, the conscious narrative that they provide for themselves to explain what they're doing is often not adequate to it. Or even one's own self-narrative about why one does what one does often leaves out. Um, it just doesn't explain it. And, and Levi Strauss argues that, that actually um, the conscious framing of the reasons for um, social practices, social structure are often obscuring, that they're, they're, they're mystifying, they're fogging, as opposed to clarifying um, uh, narratives, right? So if we really want to understand what goes on in a culture, uh, we have to actually look at the unconscious, unconscious infrastructure. So what that means is, is that you don't go into a culture or a society and you ask people why they do what they do. They don't know. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing because they're acting unconsciously. So to, so this is really important. If you want to understand why, why we have binary gender, you can't ask people, right? If you want to know why we have binary gender, you can't actually unpack the conscious statements for why there's un, uh, binary gender. So we could pick up Genesis and we could talk about sexual differentiation in Genesis and, you know, Adam's rib and these kinds of things. Oh, woman. But, but, um, but it won't get us very far. And so the, the, the point is, is, that, um, is that structural anthropology was attempting to get underneath the conscious framings uh, that, that, that cultures use to make sense of their conduct to try to find the unconscious law that's, that's operative, okay? All right, so the unconscious infrastructure number two, it doesn't treat terms as independent entities, instead takes them as a basis of analysis of the relation between terms. So we know that the gender, whatever gender is, it isn't an essential quality of woman and man, it has to do with the relationship between women, women and men. Whatever heterosexuality is, it isn't something that's the nature of that thing, it, it only uh, emerges in in uh, contradistinction in relation to other uh, categories. Um, so whatever desire is, again, it's not something that's innate. It can only make sense in relation. So understanding things in a structural matrix is important. So this is the difference between understanding a word or understanding a, a syllable or a, a phoneme in and of itself versus understanding that word or that phoneme in the context of a sentence or a paragraph or, or, or something else, right? So if I say the word that starts with F and rhymes with truck, um, the F word, right, uh, and just say it, um, that word can be analyzed in and of itself. It must mean something terrible about, about career's uh, mentality at the moment or whatever, but the meaning of it, the actual practical meaning of it is going to be embedded within both a diachronic uh, use of the term in history and in my own personal biography, as well as a synchronic relationship of that term to all of the terms that could have been deployed instead, right? And so to understand the meaning, you have to choose all of that and then understand diachronically within a sentence, a spoken sentence, um, uh, you know, a discourse, what that word means. So again, I just want to point to this. So I think it's really intelligent the way that Butler goes about analyzing sex, gender, desire. Um, it isn't just analyzing the one thing, but understanding it as a complex that is derived from relations between a number of institutions. So again, that's a kind of basic sort of sociological or structuralist sociological uh, uh, position that is not at all inconsistent with critical social theory like Marx and, and, uh, uh, and, and so on. Okay. All right. So it introduces the concept of a system, right? Um, yeah, so it, and, and there it is. And then what I disagree with strongly is this drive for general laws. You're trying to find the universalistic law that explains everything. And instead, again, I think that like Butler, I'm with her, that you stop at the position of particularity, right? 
that the particular is what matters, not the general. And uh, okay, so um, so there it is. And you know, uh, Levi Strauss's work winds up having these very sort of basic, simplified atomic structures. Like this is the basic atomic structures of attitudes within a kinship group, right? So I think what is it here? It's rights and obligations and um, mutuality and reciprocity are sort of the four poles uh, that can be done. But but he winds up um, mapping the elementary form of kinship here with pluses and minuses triangles equal signs right uh, little zeros men are triangles women are uh, circles um, the this equal is a marriage uh, relationship uh, the single line here the diagonal away from the marriage is a, is a is is uh, is descent it's a child a male child here P uh, p plus and minus refer to um, if I can get this right a positive relationship is one that is full of warmth and and of um, a familiarity of, of a gentleness of kind of um, you know a, the a buddy kind of and negative is much more distant much more remote much more respectful right so uh, you treat in this instance you have the father one's father and you're treating the father with with familiarity right buddy dad and the mother's brother here is uh treated with great respect they're the authority they're the power and so, and so this is a matrilineal society right it is the mother's brother not the mother but the mother's brother that gen that has the power the big daddy with the power isn't daddy that's your buddy instead the big daddy with the power is your mother's brother and the mother's brother is your uncle and this is known then as the avunculate, right? The avunculate. Um, the uncle relationship, right? And, um, and so one of the things that we're going to find from Levi Strauss, important for what is coming next, is that family, the elementary stru structure of kinship, has very little to do with the biological nuclear family. And it really hasn't... Uh, it, it, and it always includes an avunculate, right? Either in pure or degraded form. So, um, so what's important about this is we're going to find from Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss is going to argue that there are no societies we don't know of any that are truly matriarchal, where women have power. And one of the reasons for that in in um, in social nature is that um, the the uncle, who's known as the male mother, right? Uh, that even if you have a matrilineal society where um, you know names and descent are determined along mother lines, um, it is a man who is the male mother. It is the brother of the mother, the uncle, that takes over the position of power. Not the mother. The mother always remains mother, right? Okay, so this is going to be one of our, our basic things. So this is Levi Strauss, right? That to understand... Uh, Kinship. You don't go to the biological natural. It's not a natural thing. It's not the natural family at all, right? But it's something that emerges um, as a structure, and it's unconscious. I mean, no society, the word avunculate doesn't exist. I mean, it's I had uncles. I never thought of them in these terms, right? Um, so it's something that, that, that may be unconscious to the people who are in a society. The structure is unconscious. Even though people do it, they don't know why they do it, and they really can't even describe the pattern of why they're doing it. It's unconscious, right? So structuralism then is defining an unconscious structure, a kind of a minimal number of terms, the relationship between the terms that generate the the imaginary, the, 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 the behavior of the society itself, and actually generate the real of the children that are born uh, of the unions and so on. Okay. So the elementary structure of kinship then is always patriarchal. This is coming from this. Now we find out why is that the case, right? So patriarchy is uh, universal. There are no actually existing matriarchal societies. So the elementary structure of kinship possesses the quality of patriarchy, male power, male power, right? Um, it includes an incest taboo, which forbids um, the children from accessing mothers, but it also forbids uh, male children from accessing uh, uh, sisters in this case, right? So um, one thing that's going to be really important, as we're going to find in Butler, is she argues that prior to an incest taboo is a taboo against homosexuality. So the incest taboo is always heterosexual. It's always um, accessing 
um, that the access to a heterosexual partner always must come outside of the kin, right? So that the elementary structure of, kin set, of incest depends upon there being something outside of the kin that, um, that the men and women can marry, right? So the incest taboo is heterosexual, heteronormative, right? And that, so that means there's a taboo against homosexuality that's built into this more as we go. Because of an incest taboo, the children of the kin can't marry each other. Therefore, you have exogamy. You must search outside exo. You must go ex outside of the group to, to mate, which is what gamey refers to, right? So you're mating outside. And that the avunculate is a constant, right? It's It, it may be in a degraded form, but the male mother, the uncle of the male child, the mother's brother, um, rules, right? And so it is never mother power, it is mother brother power. And, and so even in a matrilineal society, it's still male dominant, you still have patriarchy, right? Okay, so um, really fast, let's take a look at totem and taboo. This is a drawing I use in my uh, undergraduate class. So at the end of totem and taboo, page 234, the sort of the standard uh, edition of a, a 1910 book, um, um, Freud articulates the myth of the murder of the primal father. He's sort of trying to describe how, how it is that um, bands of primates wound up falling into society. And his argument is that society always involves two things. It involves the worship of a representative of that society, a god like figure or a totem something along those lines that there's always someone who's present in spirit only who seems to have power who seems to have more power than any of the living people around who 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 occupies the position of of of, of the, the father the father god and we're going to use lacan's term here it is always the name of the father so so one of the, uh, of the kind of constants of society, according to Freud, is the name of the father. There's always going to be a father, God, or a, a, a figure that has died, and again, almost always a father here. And that with that father, God, comes the, 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 the injunction to worship. So you must worship that father, God, must be worshipped, must be honored. And the way that you honor the father God is by renouncing the father God's women, right? So so the the women of the clan, of the totem, um, must be renounced. Um, they belong to the father God. They're not yours as the child. And so, therefore, the men and women who are children of the father God, of the kin, of the clan, of the totem, um, must engage in exogamy. They must marry outside, right? So, hands off the, the the other children of the kin and you seek outside. So so this is the incest taboo, the great incest taboo. Thou shalt not touch uh, the things of the father God, the women of the father God, and if you're a masculine uh, subject here, that becomes taboo. And then thou must honor the name of the father. So the name of the father becomes the first word of power, the word that holds something like, uh, that carries the, um, the, the full sort of weight of social power, of social forces. Um, it is the word that, that signifies, that, that invokes uh, the, the social power of the group that honors the father God. So at, at any rate, you wind up with, with something like... Um, um, Totem and taboo, you wind up with an injunction to both honor the patriarchal father, so gender is involved, as well as renounce the women of the father, so gender is involved there too, right? So gender is core to social structure, all right? So this is Freud's totem and taboo. Gender is core to social structure. Both of the, again, the warp and the weft, language is always, always gendered because the Father God is the first word. The name of the Father is the first word. Often can't be spoken, but it nevertheless is the first word. And that the no of the Father is the first law. And what the Father forbids first and foremost is access to the women of the totem. So the first law is gender too. So gender is present in the great, the two great totems, thou shalt not kill or dishonor the father that must honor that's always going to have gender involved and then the the the, the 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 taboo does as well okay so there's freud 
Gender's there at the very beginning. So uh, Butler is right to go to this, right? So she's arguing if you want to understand and begin to interrogate the power linguistic power structure, the power knowledge structures that generate and sustain and reproduce gender and sex over time, Freud and the other psychoanalytic structuralists, right, are the right place to go because they here we now here have a theory of gender. So before you had something like polymorphous perversity would have been present before, um, um, you know, something like multi-sided sexual uh, uh, behaviors, as long as you can get away with it from the actually living father, you could, you know, God only knows. But once the father has become dead in the name of the father and rules with spirit instead of with actual physical force, then you have, uh, again, compulsory gender, compulsory heterosexuality, uh, um, you know, the, the, the whole system is there, right? So she's right to go there. So if you want to understand pre-historical or pre-linguistic gender and pre-linguistic sexuality and pre-linguistic desire, that would be a good place to go. Okay. All right. So I think we've got that. So yeah, so let's go back to um, Levi Strauss. So Levi Strauss argues then that you have basically um, mothers and fathers. Yeah, you have mothers, fathers, Oh, where the far? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you have you have three. <laughs> okay, so there's um, you have brothers, sisters, fathers, and sons. That's the four terms in the elementary structure of kinship: male, male, male. Only one woman, sister. Okay, and the sister is going to have to go. She's got to get the hell out of there, as Lacan says in the, in the book on uh, on encore on on uh, on feminine uh, jouissance. She's got to go. She's got to go elsewhere. Okay, and then someone, another sister's coming in. Okay, so brother, sister, father, son, the four terms. There are two pairs of correlative oppositions, um, one that is positive, familiarity, um, uh, intimacy, and so on, and one that is negative, fear, uh, distance, uh, reverence, that kind of thing. So some relationships have intimacy and familiarity, and some have distance and power and reverence. Um and then there are three types of relationships that have to be present in the elementary structure. You have to have consanguinity, shared blood. That's the sibling relationship. You have to have affinity. That's the husband and wife relationship. And then you have to have descent. That's the parent-child relationship. And they're all present in the most basic structure. The unifying principle then of this patriarchal elementary form of kinship is the incest, taboo, and exogamy, right? So... There it is. So men are represented here by triangles, women by circles. So uh, in matrilineal societies, uh, a man and a woman marry. They have a male child. Um, if it's matrilineal, the uh, uncle is always going to be involved. And then uh, uh, Radcliffe Brown, and then backed up by Levi Strauss, argues that there's always an inverse relationship, that in societies that have a familiar relationship between father and son, there's always going to be reverence between the son and the uncle. And in a matrilineal society, the uncle has reverence. That's the negative, reverence. That's power. You're afraid of them, right? That kind of thing. Okay. So in patriarchal, patrilineal society, it's going to be the other way. You're afraid of big daddy, right? And then the uncle takes on the role of the sort of loving buddy, right? Buddy, uncle, and I'm scared of big daddy. Okay. So there it is. And and what's kind of missing here a little bit, because it's difficult to, to show, is what happens you know, with the women. So I tried to depict this. So if you go another generation out, okay, so here we have uh, uh, Cletus, this son, Cletus. Cletus is, he yeah, yeah, Cletus is going to be here. Cletus is going to have to get married, and Cletus is going to have to go over here to this other clan and pick up old um, um, Becky Sue, and Becky Sue is going to wind up married to Cletus, and Cletus and Becky Sue are, are going to have an offspring down here, and uh, and that offspring now, because we're in a matrilineal society, is actually going to be um, dominated by or subject to the power of Becky Sue's brother rather than Cletus. So Cletus is going to be relatively powerless. It's going to be Becky Sue's brother that's going to have power. We'll call him Jethro. So Jethro has power, not Cletus, and so on. So... so um, so you have to have this exchange of daughters. So Becky Sue had to get out and go somewhere else. Uh, Cletus's sister, we'll call her, uh, um, 
Martha. Martha had to leave, and she wound up married to uh, to Jethro. So, so you've got this this exchange of women. So, that in essence is the reason why um, uh, women don't have a subject position here, right? That in Lacanian, Levi Straussian, so the symbolic order is here. Language and law are here, and women don't have a subject position. They're the objects of bride exchange objects of of exogamous marriage they're objects of the incest taboo but they are not subjects these are masculinist subject systems masculinist symbolic systems right so women are essentially barred from subjectivity they're objects instead right all right so these are unconscious structures that exist imperfectly in human consciousness uh, again, this isn't the biological family. That's the elementary structure of kinship. It always has to include something beyond. There always has to be something more than the, uh, the, 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 the biological offspring. You always have to have the relationship of, of, of affinity in order to get that avunculate established. Okay, So the avunculate turns out to be the key to the elementary structures of kinship that takes it beyond the uh, biological family and incorporates it inside of a larger patriarchal structure. And it must be patriarchal, he claims, because in social nature we've never seen anything else. So it isn't that it isn't theoretically possible for there to be a matriarchal society. He just says we haven't seen it, and therefore this is the elementary structure uh, that kinship takes on. Okay. All right, so women lack identity within the system. They're a mere empty space uh, uh, of exchange, right? They're objects of exchange, objects of desire even, rather than subjects of, of, uh, of linguistic discourse. So there we have it. So, so that's structural anthropology. That's uh, the basic structure of kinship uh, and that women are essentially excluded from subject positions within it. Um, as um, Butler uh, has those great quotes, from uh, Levi Strauss, where she um, quotes him as saying that, um, let me see if I can find it here, that that the elementary structure of kinship is essentially, yeah, there it is. It's essentially homosocial desire. That the men of one kinship system desire. Um, interaction or desire linkage with the men of another uh, uh, kinship system. So that's homosexuality, homosocial desire. And the way that they do it, because they're both banned from incest and banned from homosexual relations, is that they have to exchange women. So the women become the object that's exchanged. Exchange and consequently the rule of exogamy is not simply that of goods exchanged. Exchange and consequently the rule of exogamy that expresses it has in itself a social value, provides the means of binding men together. So men get bonded together in a homosocial formation through the exchange of women, right? So women are not the subject of this. It is the men that are bonded, right? It's the men that are bonded. That's the social bond, not the marriage bond. The marriage bond is something that is simply a kind of uh, derivative of this larger kinship structure. Um, all right? Okay. All right. So um, so that is Lacanian, uh, excuse me, that's Levi Strauss's um, a structural anthropology in the elementary uh, uh, form of kinship. Here we go. Okay. All right. Then on page 59, she talks about Lacan's theory of gender and sexual difference. Okay. All right, so so just to, uh, we'll just read it. Lacan's theory is rooted in the originary, the originary. So every infant has an originary desire for the mother, right? The mother is originally uh, is a part object. It's actually the the breasts of the or, uh, of the mother that can be actually the the, the organ or the object of of, uh, of desire. Um, and then eventually through a process that takes some time, um, I'm going to show you some images that I, I draw. I drew a few years back. I taught a social psychology class where I was trying to uh, uh, illustrate. Um, um, this is ridiculous. I'm actually afraid to show it to you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. There. Uh, here. Let me, uh, we'll just go right to it. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. So, uh, so this is uh, the process of introjection. Here we go. So an infant is fed and not just. Uh, food, but 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 touch. So the infant that's interacting with the mother is uh, is is getting a sense of self. The the, the body surfaces are being um, uh, stimulated. They're being touched. They're being felt. And uh, and 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 that is that process 
of um, stroking in essentially uh, the contours and the boundaries of the infant's bodily, embodied existence is uh, is something that happens uh, um, um, uh, very early in life, and and that and so that the child. I was going to show you another picture. Uh, uh, I, I hesitate to. Maybe I won't. Now that I've set it up, I almost feel like I have a need to do it. Yeah. So, um, uh, pardon me. This can't do it. Um, anyway, um, uh, but yeah, the basic idea is that, um, no, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Anyway, that, that the child early on, as long as the child is being, I'll use this one. This one's better. It, 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 as long as the child is being satisfied and gratified, the mother -er seems to be part of the self, that the other is already incorporated in the self and the self is already incorporated in the other. There's one being. It's the mother-child uh, dyad that's, that's almost like monstrously coupled together, right? But when the mother disappears, the self and the mother both seem to be all bad, right? So the frustrating mother uh, appears in the child's consciousness like this, all bad, I'm all bad, mother all bad. When the child is subject to gratification and, and, and love and tenderness and getting their needs met and comfortable and happy and you know having um, a good night moon read to them and so on, then it's the all good mother uh, 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 here. And so the self and other are good. So again, initially every child again is drawn to the mother's uh, initially organs of food and, and so on, but then the mother also feeds touch, care, uh, comfort, and then at, at, over a, just a very short period of time, six months or so, the child begins to differentiate self and mother, and um, and then uh, if it happens appropriately, well, Jesus, I'm not going to show you this. Anyway, it, 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 enough of that, but, 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 but the point is when the child, when the mother isn't there and the bad mother seems to be present because you're not getting cared for, um, over time, the um, child comes into possession of an image of the mother in their own mind. They get object permanence. So when the mother's not there, they can imagine the mother being there. And they, they can calm themselves, soothe themselves by just imagining the mother, right? They get object permanence, okay? So at that point, the child has now internalized the mother. The mother is now, uh, in, uh, an, uh, they've, they've brought the mother inside of themselves in some way, right? Okay, so the originary desire of every infant is for the mother or the mother -er to be more, or mother-ers to be more accurate today. The place the children in a position of, again, this is a technical term from Lacan, the imaginary phallus. What that means is, is that infants um, come into the position of being the object of the mother's desire. And that's going to be called the imaginary phallus in, in, in Lacan's terms. So, so what, the, what does the mother want? The mother wants the child. Uh, the child is the apple of the mother's eye and so on. And so that's the imaginary phallus. So the, the child is in the position of being that. So castration, which we all know from Freud, is a different meaning. But to Lacan, castration is the cutting off and the separation from the mother, right? The ceasing to be the imaginary phallus or the object of the mother's eye. Um, and, and that happens at about the time when you're ripped away and put into something like kindergarten. You get the substitute then for what Lacan is going to call a symbolic phallus, which is going to be a kind of position within a social structure from which you're able to enjoy in a very limited way and enjoy in a way that satisfies not the mother, because the mother's not even there, she's never going to see. Instead, it's satisfying this big other, this larger symbolic structure that's going to have local representat representatives, like a teacher, but is nevertheless linked to a much, much, much larger uh, structure. So at about the age of five or six, when the child is ripped away from the mother from the home and is jammed inside of a larger structure of development to control and so on, the school, which is always linked to the world of work, which is always going to be linked to the world of politics and the world of, of religion and all these other sort of institutional structures, the big other, you're going to be linked to the larger society. So that's the symbolic phallus, the position within the larger social order, that the absolute social order from which you're able to, to be situated and work and enjoy, right? So, so that's it. So, so the gender differences now. All right, so let's see if we can do this. So here's an image of this, okay? So um, we, we looked at a version of this in the last, uh, like, two videos back. Okay. Okay, so um, so babies are born as uh, subjects of their organic drives, the real drives of the organ, organs, satisfied by a mother, 
indicated here by a small letter A. Autre is aut, aut, aut is the um, French word A U T R E for other. So small other and actually existing other. Um, in that biological relationship, the mother's you become the object of the mother's desire. What am I to the mother, right? And that's called the mere relationship. Where you develop an imaginary sense of self, an imaginary sense of other, and then you become, sub, again, subject to the desire of the specific others. That's what it is to be basically an adolescent all the way through the time you go to school, at which point, I'm, I'm simplifying this, at which point you get cut away from the mother and you become installed within a school. This is the principal or this is Mrs. Lemke, your second grade teacher, whatever it would be. Who, is, who occupies the, uh, the position of the paternal function, right? The position of the, of the big A. So the big A isn't somebody that actually exists. The big A is the symbolic order itself, society as a whole, the universal society, the God thing. And so this is what it is to develop in uh, Lacan. Begin as a subject of your organs. I'm subject to my organic drives. You get that from Mother Urs. In that process, you eventually develop an Im image of self and other. Again, object permanence that places an image of the mother in the self. And the self winds up being projected into the mother so that you become subject to the mother's desires, the mother-er's desires. Again, I'm gendering it here. Just We should gender it in a way because that's what Butler's trying to get at here. This is a gendered uh, 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 model. And then all the way through the big other, which society as a whole, the external society, takes on a masculine patriarchal configuration. Um, and the paternal function, again, it can be your first grade teacher, your kindergarten teacher, who forces you to leave your mother and wind up in, uh, in a school where you're doing things that are ultimately linked to the larger social structure, the whole politics, the economy, and so on. Okay, so, what ha so, so, so at, when this happens then, if I can draw this, you wind up cut, right? So Lacan calls this the barred subject. You wind up that the full subject position, the Lacanian subject, is somebody who has been barred, right? You're in school, you're subject to the big other, you no longer are the object of the mother's uh, love, and you're no longer the apple of the mother's eye, you're gone. And what you're doing in the school isn't satisfying the mother who doesn't exist. You're satisfying the symbolic commands of the big other. You're going after gr something as weird as a grade. Who the heck cares about a grade? I can't eat it. I can't play with it. I can't touch it. It doesn't feel good. But I nevertheless work hard so I get a high grade. And, or I work hard so that I get a promotion or get something else or get an award or something like that, right? So we work hard for these symbolic rewards instead of working to please the mother who then makes us the apple of her eye, something along those lines, right? Okay, so this whole thing is structured, and in route to becoming a subject of the big other, you stop being, to a degree, the subject of the small other, and you are cut off from your organic drives as well. You become a split subject. All right, so castration, as we know, is a very, very gendered thing. Um, uh, God, I've got this here drawn in. Uh, shit, these are horrible pictures. All right, yeah, we'll do it right here. Okay, so... Here's what castration is. So castration, the split subject who's pulled away from the mother-er and becomes the subject of the symbolic order and the subject of the unconscious. What that means is, is you're pulled away and jammed inside of, say, a school or an apprenticeship or you're moved to someone else's home and you're working there as a uh, worker for them or you're installed in a neighboring village doing work there, but you're no longer subject to of you no longer a subject of the mother, you're no longer a subject of the mother's love, that kind of thing. And now you're being installed within a larger symbolic order, here like a school, a first grade, a second grade, and that installation inside requires you to give something up. And that's what this little thing here is located at the level of the genitals, basically. You're giving up um, your pleasure. You're giving up the toys that are laying in your bedroom, you're giving up access to the mother, you're giving up the ability to be an imaginary um, um, object of desire for your mother, you're giving that up. We don't want to give it up, but we have to, right? So that's what castration is. So castration is the forced renunciation of the mother and the mother the, the, of organic drives, the pleasures of organic drives, the pleasures of polymorphous uh, 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 drives, 
and then giving up the image of ourself as uh, the, the loved object, the imaginary phallus, right? What do you get in return? Well, you get jammed into the social structure somewhere, and then you're given not a, uh, a real phallus, you're given a symbolic phallus, um, which is like a, a thing that lets you uh, enjoy. So you get a position, you get a grade, you get a, yeah, you're a first grader now, right? That kind of thing. All right, so when you're jammed in, you lose that initial thing. You stop having an initial other, an A in front of you. You don't have the A, you don't have the mother in front of you. And so you now begin to desire in a different way. You're no longer desiring the actual mother in front of you. You've had to renounce that and give that up. And instead, you now begin to desire in the form of fantasy, uh, the object A, right? So instead of the mother, you begin to desire uh, a replacement for the mother. If you're a male subject, this is going to be important in Butler. If you're a male subject, you're going to be desiring a substitute for the mother, another woman, another. if you're heterosexual male anyway, right? And so, but you have to get to a certain point in your life before you can do that, right? You have to have good grades and get a job and be able to, you know, pay for dates and, you know, pay for a crappy old pickup truck to take someone out on a date, something like that, right? Or you have to be able to, you know, support a family, whatever the right word would be. You have to get somewhere, so the fantasy of coming into possession of a substitute for the mother requires you to obey the dictates of the big other, right? So you become a subject of the big other en route to gaining the ability to enjoy the object A, right? The, uh, that, that you're allowed to enjoy um, later once you're, you've been in there. Okay. So there it is. So being installed in the big other is painful. We have to lose something. We, that's what castration is. We're losing the ability to enjoy uh, and so on. And so we wind up, um, uh, yeah, living this out. Okay, so I think that does it for, oh yeah, so that gives us the basis of this. So, so gender is everywhere in Freud and Lacan. Everything is gendered. Uh, the subject position is almost always a male subject position, right? The, um, okay, now, back to, back to fantasy. Okay, so in Butler's writings, it's, it's just really good how she does this. So on page 78, she makes a jump to talking about Freud's uh, concept of melancholia, which is, you know, we, use it, we would use that as a term for depression today. Uh, so people are really depressed, have melancholia. Um, um, he was trying to understand that. And then he was comparing and contrast it to mourning. All right? So Freud and the unmentioned Klein, Melanie Klein makes a big deal about mourning of the mother. Big deal about that. Um, and the chapter is called Freud and uh, on the Melancholia of Gender. So most of what she gets here, she's getting from the book Ego and uh, the Ego and the Id which is, um, I probably just messed it up. Um, yeah, the ego and the id. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's, let's look at Freud first. And this will be a skeleton key to what uh, comes up in, in Butler, okay? So he's writing in the ego and the id, and he says that um, we must widen our range a little. We succeed in, by, in explaining the painful disorder of melancholia by supposing that in those suffering from it, in you know depression, an object which was lost has been reinstated within the ego. That is, that an object cathexis has been replaced by an identification. So let's talk about what that means. Um, okay, so the infant in the position of the um, yeah so so this infant who's engaged with a mother a mother -er, this is sort of our original love relationship to Freud right the original love relationship is to the mother and so you, you fall in love you you think about her all the time you orient yourself to her you want nothing more than the mother to really want and to desire you and to think you're good that kind of thing right that's what it means to be the imaginary phallus is that you're the mother's object of desire and the thing that makes her happy and so this relationship is a love relationship and it's an imaginary relationship it exists in 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 fantasy it takes a phantasmagoric uh, uh, quality to it 
And that, um, and so this is Melanie Klein now. So to Melanie Klein, you don't have object relations. You don't have the ability to sustain the frustration of the mother not being there until you have the ability to imagine the mother inside. That is mourning. So Melanie Klein develops Freud and argues that an infant by the age of, say, two or three definitely has the ability to imagine the good mother when the good mother isn't there. That means they have the ability to imagine the self as essentially good even when the good mother isn't present. So object permanence also gives someone a stable sense of self, a stable sense of good self, essentially, that sustains them through frustrations and um, you know uh, difficult times, that kind of thing, right? But it's a love relationship, and 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 so and so the way that uh, you know as you mature, you're spending less and less time with the mother, and certainly by the time you're you're on your way to uh, school or something, you're giving her up for long periods of time. But the way that you sustain, uh, the subject sustains itself when the mother isn't there is by incorporating the mother inside, by identifying with the mother, okay? So the way that we know that this has happened, that the normal, especially female child, woman child, girl, has identified with the mother is that they self-soothe by playing with dolls. If you play with a doll, that means that you're soothing yourself by imagining yourself as mother. You're identifying with the mother. You are the mother. You do the same things as the mother would do. You're identify. I am identical with the mother, and I soothe myself by soothing the doll, basically, right? As opposed to soothing oneself by having like a picture of the mother that you look at or, or a toy that's a mother. So this is identification. And we know right now that of the two genders that that women, girls, are really encouraged and, um, and patterned and typed by some compulsory gender system to identify strongly with the mother. And that little boys who play with dolls, who take care of little infants and feed them and cuddle them and stuff, are considered um, unusually strange, right, in, in, in the compulsory heterosexual uh, gender system, right? At least this would have been true in the time of, of Freud, and this is what, what, what Butler is, is putting in question, okay? All right. So, mourning and melancholia. So, we know that at the moment of castration, every child has to give up the mother. And we know that in Freud, uh, it, and the incest taboo is present here, right? That the father figure possesses the mother. So, there's a rivalry that goes on between the child and the father, and that you, so that the way that this plays out is that a male child who's heterosexual, and, and Freud calls that a positive resolution of the Oedipal complex, right? A boy child who's heterosexual is going to simply have to give up the mother by incorporating the mother inside of oneself in, as a kind of identification. You're going to mourn the mother for a while, right? And that mourning process is going to be experienced as melancholy as depression for a time. And then you're going to orient yourself towards coming into possession of a replacement for the mother, right? So you're going to have an object choice. You're going to be replacing the mother with another one. So uh, I really like how Butler says this. This is essentially mourning. Mourning is the process of giving up right? Of giving up a lost object of love. You're giving it up and identifying with it instead, all right? And that takes time, and, it, and it's, it's limited in duration, and we know that in, in, in actual social history or social nature, um, mourning is a widespread process, and that like widows had to mourn a particular period of time, three years, and that then they were allowed to remarry again, or uh, we know that people have slipped out of mourning for a lost love when they're capable of entering in to something like a healthy or well-defined uh, love relationship with someone else. So mourning is a temporary thing. Melancholy is permanent. So what the heck causes melancholia? Well, this is where Freud gets really interesting. So Freud claims that melancholia is a more permanent thing that comes from, um, you know, something has gone awry. I'm not going to have time to work it all through here. Um, but basically, the idea is that it's something much more uh, significant and permanent. Mourning doesn't have an object related to it. 
excuse me, morning has an object. I miss X. Someone has died. I miss them. I can conjure their face. I can imagine what they look like. I know their name. And that process is, 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 has a temp temporality to it. It recedes over time. Melancholia is permanent. There is no face. It's much more permanent. In fact, and so, and so here's what's interesting. So Freud basically argues, this is, this is Butler's claim, that Freud basically argues that boys wind up mourning their mother. But as the title of chapter 2 says, um, the, the, um, or of the, at least that section of chapter 2 says, that, there's a, that gender is, um, is mourning. That girls who are feminine have to not only renounce the mother as an object of love, but they also have to renounce the mode of love. So boys, their love for their mother was heterosexual, and they only have to renounce her, but then get another girl to substitute, another woman to substitute. For girls, they have double repression which means that they're not only giving up the specific object, the mother, but they're giving up the entire mode of, of homo uh, um, social, or excuse me, of, of, of same-sex uh, desire, of gay desire. So the taboo against homosexuality then is linked to mourning, and she's making the argument that gender as such, the woman's gender, results from this need to not only give up the mother, but to give up women as objects of love, which means that, that, that you have to do it by essentially disavowing that you had ever loved the mother. And so that means that the, you have to disavow that, that the mother had ever been an object of love, which is something that the boy doesn't need to do. The boy doesn't have to renounce the mother. They can become very friendly to the mother and, and, and remember them fondly and think of them as alma mater. We, men think of their schools that way. And they substitute. But for girls, there's home, heterosexual girls, there's this need to get rid of and disavow the entire mode of desire. So that sets up mourning. So it's a much more a radical um, and much more, um, uh, I think, disruptive um, subject position uh, where you haven't just had to repress an object choice, but you have to repress the entire mode of, of choosing as well. So just this point here, she uses Joan of Air. She's doing all kinds of interesting things here. But, and I'm out of time, but, but I just want to point to this. So what, 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 what Butler has done so brilliantly is take something that is usually disavowed by, by anybody who's a serious scholar. I mean, you can't be an undergraduate in America without hearing uh, really negative accounts of Freud and really negative accounts of Lacan and, and really, ne really negative accounts of, of 19th and 20th century anthropology and, and, and of structural anthropology and so on, it, but especially Freud. Freud is, is really an object of scorn. And here we find feminist theorists who are very seriously taking, uh, who are taking Freud very seriously and Lacan very seriously, and are extracting from them um, uh, theoretical insights and theoretical models. And not by taking it uncritically. There's a critical, there's a theoretical project here, where you're not just uh, abs absorbing and reproducing uh, Freudian or structuralist psychoanalytic theory, but you're turning it. And so this is really important. So what? What Butler does in chapter two and chapter three of the book then is she takes psych structuralist psychoanalytic theory and turns it. She reproduces it with a twist. She subverts it. That's what we need to do with theory. Theory isn't sacred. It's not a biblical text. It is a tool or a thing that lets us grasp and comprehend the structure of the social world, but it isn't something that we should reproduce as though it was a sacred thing unchanged. Instead, it needs to be grasped, comprehended, and subverted. So, in, so, so what, what Butler does then in, in, in the next chapters, chapter three and the last chapter of the book, is she works out a subversive theory of sexual uh, practice, a kind of intervention where you're you're in, you're understanding and comprehending and acknowledging the compl complex structures of heteronormativity of of, of compulsive heterosexuality of patriarchy. You're acknowledging this. You're understanding it, but then you're using that under understanding to subvert it. So you're not by comprehending it and by 
speaking in the terms, right, of those structures of power, of that matrix of power, you're powerfully, you're placing yourself in a position to intervene, to consciously intervene. Now, the world has a history. The world is going to change anyway. So here we have a social theorist grabbing hold of one of the most foundational structures of society, gender, sexuality, desire, grabbing hold of it in thought, in concept, in theory, finding the vulnerability, finding the, the, the frailty, and then using that as a means to make history go a little bit faster. That's what it is to be um, a sort of an agent of progressive change. It's what it is to be a modern person, really, is to grab hold of history. Remember uh, William Buckley? The conservative is the person who stands athwart history yelling, stop. If that's what you're doing, you have no need for social theory. If you're going to theorize a social structure, it's to comprehend it in its complexity so that you can intervene and direct history to be one of the switch, you know, to control the switch on the train tracks of history, right? So that you're able to intervene and, and, and make it go in a progressive direction that increases human freedom, that increases the, the universal subjectivity of, 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 of half of humanity, right? And that leads us in a direction where all of us can flourish, right? So, so if you care about democratic politics, not small d with, a, with, you know, with the Democratic Party, but democracy as such, right? Um, and, and a future where people can be self-determining and, and, and um, self-managing, and where we can form coalitions and dialogue across difference as a means of forming politics that gets us somewhere, Butler's essential. So I hope you found this helpful. So again, 19th to 20th century psychoanalytic social thought, structural social thought as a foundation upon which to build late 20th and early 21st century of feminist theory. I hope you found it helpful. Take care.